Good morning. Oh, so good to see you. Let's stand together as we begin our time of worship. Are you ready to worship? Here we go. One, two, one, two. it's easier to sing that than others. This is a good day. Hallelujah, the sun came up and is shining brightly outside this morning, and we thank the Lord for that. Not only that, because of his abundant rain that he has sent, I verified this morning, Lake Bob Sandlin is full to the brim. So we've got an abundant supply of water for our drinking purposes. So in that regard, in that vein, it's easy to see 
the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God. But beyond that, some of you sitting here this morning, it's not all good. It's not all bright and shiny. It's broken up and dented pretty bad. And the good news is our God, our faithful God, is as good in your moment as he is in our brightest sunshiny moments. And I'm grateful for the faithfulness of God. Welcome to worship this morning. This is another good gathering. We had good church in early church, good group of folk who came together to be with us today. And I'm glad that you've come. And uh, if you're here today for your first time, this is your first foray at First Baptist Church, and you're trying to figure out who we are and how this thing works, well, just know that we're glad that you've come. We want you to, to feel the freedom to participate with us, not just to watch, but you participate. You actively join us as we worship together. And my prayer is that the Lord, uh, who knew you were coming, speaks to you and you'll be able to hear what he has prepared for you on this day as well. A couple of announcements for you. One, one of our longtime members who has been struggling mightily in recent days with a, a plethora of physical issues finally won the victory over that illness this week. Weldon Campbell uh, has died, and, and he is in the presence of the Lord this morning. And uh, I'm grateful for that, but I pray for his family as they mourn his loss. His memorial service is going to be Tuesday afternoon at 1 o'clock right here in our auditorium. So just be mindfully prayerful for, for Huella and for Kyle and their family as we move forward. We're also very thankful for these gorgeous flowers that have been placed here uh, celebrating the fact that John and Karen Vineyard in just a few days are going to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. That, that is quite the milestone, and uh, we are glad to be able to, to acknowledge that and celebrate that together with them. We're going to continue on in our time of worship together this morning. Uh, We've got uh, today and then Wednesday night with this passage of Scripture. I told the folks in early church, you've been so good with this lengthy passage that has some tongue twisters in it. You have mastered it well over the course of January. I think in February we're going to go to Jesus wept. And, and let that, probably not, but it'll be a little shorter, I'm sure. Let's stand together and worship together in the Word this morning. Say this one with me, if you will. Nehemiah 1, 8 and 9. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. Nehemiah 1, 8 and 9. Take just a moment. Speak a word of greeting to somebody close to you as we continue to worship together.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host.
may be seated. I invite you to join us around this altar as we come together. As we come, I don't want you to think about just one thing. Think about what the Lord has done for you today. Not yesterday, but since you woke up this morning. He is faithful. He is good. He is with us through everything. Think about what he's done. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace. Father, you teach us in your word that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Not a cowering fear, not drawing back like an abused puppy that's afraid of being hit, but that reverential awe where we acknowledge who you are and see ourselves in the light of who you are. Oh, forgive us, Father, for treating you like our lackey, like the chef back in the kitchen where we place our order and tell you what we want and and how we want it, and we expect it to be done perfectly. And if it is, we might even leave you a little tip. But if it's not, we are going to complain and complain and complain. Forgive us, Father, for thinking that we have the right and the power to grab you by the lapels and drag you down to us and make you more like us. Again, you teach us in your word that when we humble ourselves before you, you will lift us up. You will exalt us. So I pray this morning, Father, that we can see ourselves in the right perspective, in the right light, that we would humble ourselves before you, acknowledging our need, our sin, our brokenness, also acknowledging your love like we've just sung. You're willing to expend grace and to pick us up and to give us your life. Thank you, Father, for faithfully, patiently being who you are. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
The movie was released in 1983. And it didn't, didn't do all that well at the box office. In fact, it didn't even cover the cost of producing the movie in the early days. Fast forward a number of years, it finally was released to the streaming services and it became much more popular. There seemed to be more interest in it at that time. It was that story of our race to space. It talked about all those men who were key players in those early days of trying to, fl trying to fly supersonically, trying to, to break into the Earth's orbit, trying to, to do something that had never been done before. Of course, the Russians, when they launched Sputnik in 1957, I believe, that spurred the, the race to space, and we kind of got on it at that point. But the movie followed those who were involved in the process, and it was called The Right Stuff. When I was reading chapter 2 of Nehemiah and, and trying to uh, empathize with him and put myself in his place, I realized that this is a story about a guy who had the right stuff. Now, he was in, in a tough place. He was a long way from home, as it were. Now, Jerusalem had never been home for him, but it was home because that's where his roots were. That's where his countrymen were. That's where his forefathers had lived. And it represented something special for him. It was the place not only where those forefathers were buried, but it was the place where, where God had worked in very powerful ways. And he felt sympathy for what was going on back there, but he was trapped. Had a good job, royal cupbearer, and he enjoyed doing what he did, and he kept doing what he did, but he knew that something needed to be done. But he appeared to be stuck. For us, life is messy. It's a mix, good and bad, success and failure, pleasure and pain. It just depends on the day and the circumstances. But sometimes we get stuck. I would suggest this morning that there are probably a number of you, maybe even many of you in the room, who may be, if not a whole lot of stuck, a little stuck. And by that I mean you found yourself in a circumstance or a set of circumstances that you can't get out of. It might be good. It could be comfortable and you may not be very motivated to get out of it. You're just content to keep doing the same thing day in and day out, the same pattern day in and day out, and, and enjoying the relative comfort of that sameness. But sometimes it's bad. It's not that you're stuck in a good place. You're stuck in a bad place, but it's what you know. It's familiar. And the prospect of breaking out of that or moving beyond that is a bit intimidating because you don't know what that would look like. And unfortunately, some of us are more content to stay in a, in a bad, predictable situation than to risk an unknown, better situation stuck. Stuck. I believe Nehemiah gives us a good template, a three-part template for, for getting out of that place, moving on not just moving on for the sake of moving on, not just getting on with life per se, but, but being able to move forward with what God has planned because he's got a plan. Moving forward with what God has prepared for us out there because he has prepared something for us uh, and it takes the right stuff. I'm only going to read the first four verses of Nehemiah chapter 2. It's a lengthy chapter and I would like for you to keep your Bible open if you will and I'll reference the uh, succeeding passages, but the first four verses give us the, the background for everything that we're going to look at. And it came about in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. A couple of things I need to tell you, that's his job. He's the royal cupbearer, and that means he, he's the taster, if you will, to make sure nobody's going to poison the king. He's kind of the right-hand man. He has the king's confidence. And so on this day, he's just doing his job. He do, he's doing what he did every day. And he has consciously been trying not to let the king and the queen see on his face what's going on in his heart. Some of us are better at that than others. Some of you can hide well. Some of you, you don't need to play poker because you have no poker face. He'd been trying very hard to keep it inside but on this day this day things were different so the king said to me why is your face sad though you are not sick 
This is nothing but sadness of heart. Nehemiah said, then I was very much afraid. Because you see, it, it wasn't becoming, it wasn't appropriate for him to allow his personal life to creep into his work. It wasn't appropriate for him to bring his feelings into the presence of the king. He needed to be on. Like those guards that you see that are guarding Buckingham Palace that have to stand there. Those guards at the tomb of the unknown soldier, they have to stand there and never change their expression because they are on duty. Nehemiah was on duty. Then I was very much afraid because he could have been cast out. He could have been fired. He could have been who knows what. I said to the king, a customary greeting, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? Just kind of get it out there. Vomit it out. This is what's going on, king. Let me just tell you. The king said to me, what would, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. What do you need, Nehemiah? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Oh, that wasn't the first time he had prayed. He wasn't throwing up a Hail Mary. He wasn't sending up some good thoughts. He was continuing what he'd been doing for five months. I said I believe there's a template here, and I think that there is a three-part template that would help any of us in the room or all of us in the room begin to get or get completely unstuck, to move on beyond those circumstances where you might have allowed yourself just to sit down and and, and be happy and fat and sassy, but not very productive for the kingdom. Or it could be that you're stuck in that place, it's bad, but you don't know any different. It's just become so customary, so routine, that you've embraced it, accepted it, and uh, this is life, and you're not sure how to move beyond. Here's the template. Point number one. It was the right time, because God chooses to work within time. The text provides us that timeline. It came about in the month Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. So from that moment in chapter 1, when the messengers came from Jerusalem and told Nehemiah what was going on, when they shared with him about the city and how broken down it was, how the walls were still torn down, the gates were burned, it was just a mess. And, and at that moment, we learn in chapter 1 that he began to pray and fast and mourn. It just got to him. How in the world could, could things back home be so bad? There had been earlier hope that the, the city was going to be rebuilt and the temple was going to be rebuilt, but all that had gotten put on hold because of some adversaries who had pitched a fit. How in the world could, could we just sit by and let this continue to happen? So he prayed and he wept and he mourned and he did his job. And he kept that going for five months. For five months, he prayed and he waited. He prayed and he waited. Well, we are, as he was, bound by time. We can't escape it. It is, according to the big clock in the back, 11.23 a.m. I mean, that's for all of us this morning. We can't say it's a different time for any of us. We can choose our own time. No, that's the time that it is, 11.23 a.m. We are bound by that time, and, and some of you are more bound than others. And by the way, I, I can sympathize with you. I wasn't here last Sunday. Cindy and I went to Austin to watch our grandson be baptized, and I sat where you sit. I, in their church, it would have been right about over here where Richard and Crystal were. We were down in front of where their baptistry was, and their pastor is preaching through the book of Revelation. The Sunday before he preached the first chapter, last Sunday he chose to preach chapters two and three, all seven letters to the churches at Revelation, all seven letters. I lost count and felt guilty sitting there thinking, oh dear God, will it ever end? I was, well, I was doing what y'all have shown me to do. You know, you're good for the first 10 or 15 minutes and then you start doing that cheek shift. And then it's this. I mean, I know. I, I was sneaking peeks. It, it's hard to make that look spiritual, but, you know, every now and then I'd just sneak a peek. And it was only 30 seconds later than the last time I looked. You're bound by time, and sometimes you think, 
Dear God, will this ever end? And, and you, you wonder sometimes, does he know what time it is? I know. I'm always aware of the time. And I bought this clock. The deacons didn't install this for my sake. I bought that big clock on the back wall with the big red letters because I want to know what time it is. Five months. That's a long time to pray and to wait. We're impatient folk. We want things to happen like that. Well, I prayed about it. How many times? Well, I prayed once. I asked God for healing. I asked God for direction. I asked God to take care of this, and I just hadn't gotten an answer yet. Really? Once? Five months. And I don't know the words that he used. I don't know how he verbalized his concern, but his heart was broken that back in Jerusalem, the city was in ruins and the people were in ruins. And he wasn't sure what to do, so he did what he knew to do. He prayed and he waited and he did his job. I mean, that's, that's what you do when you wait. You, you pray and, and you wait and you're open to the Lord's leadership and you do at the moment what you know is the right thing to do until he tells you what's next. So he prayed and he waited and he mourned and he kept on doing his job. Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40 gave us this promise. Those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. It's not just twiddling your thumbs. It's not just yawning, hoping this will end soon. It is expectantly looking for God. And again, I don't know how Nehemiah did that. Every day going and being the royal cupbearer, every day taking his place and doing his thing, while at the same time keeping his ears open and his heart attuned to the God whom he trusted, waiting for what was next. Waiting for the Lord is not inactivity. It's not passivity. It's obediently watching for his direction, continuing to do what we know is right until God shows us that next step. That's what he had done, the right time. The second part of the template is the right plan. I don't know how it all came down. But in the course of that five months, God was giving Nehemiah bits and pieces. The plan was coming together. And God always has a plan. He's never caught off guards. He's not surprised by any of our situations. He's not flummoxed by any set of circumstances that we can bring to him. No, he's got a plan because he is the God of order. The moment came. I don't know that he could have seen it coming, but it came. The king asked, and I paraphrase, what's up with you? Why the, why the long face? That day he wasn't, wouldn't have been a very good poker player. On that day, he, it was there. The sadness was there. And it had to have clicked, this is the time. I've got I've to take the next step. I've got to do what the Lord has told me to do. So I told the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? And the king asked, what do you want? If it please the king and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Let me be your representative there. Let me, uh, let me represent you, if you will, but let me go and address what has so broken me and so concerns me. And the king said to me, with the queen sitting beside him, well, how long will your passage be, your journey be, and, and when will you return? Time again. Yeah, I'm interested, but I need to know what the bounds are of what you've got planned. He had a plan. If it pleased the king... Let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. That's one thing I need, king. I'm going to be going through some places where they're not too friendly, and they're not going to look kindly on the, uh, the mission that I'm on. So if you'd just give me a letter that I could hand to them that would get me passage through. What else? If you don't mind, I'd like a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress which is by the temple, for the wall of the city and for the house to which I will go. He said, okay. So he granted time off. He granted a letter or a series of letters to the governors of the provinces that he would be going through, and he gave him a, a, basically a purchase order to the keeper of the king's forest, Asaph, for materials to rebuild the gates and to rebuild the wall. Did that just come to him in that moment? No, I don't think so. 
You see, I think in, in five months of praying, God had begun to show him, okay, bub, this is going to be a big task, and, and you need to be ready, and here are some things that you need to think about. He brought them to mind, and Nehemiah thought about them and prayed again about that and, and had this list in his mind that he was able to give to the king at the right time. So he loads up, and he heads to Jerusalem, a land that he'd heard about, a land that was special to him, but, but a land that he hadn't laid eyes on ever. And he gets to Jerusalem, and, and rather than calling a press conference and gathering up all the lackeys who were left behind, he just kind of settled in to his room and got comfortable. And after a couple of days, he let the sun go down, and then he went out and took a little trip around Jerusalem, toured the walls, because he needed to see it with his own eyes. They had told him how bad it was, but he needed to see it and verify that they were telling him the truth before he would take that next step. And he moved around, and sure enough, it was as bad, if not worse, than they had said. And so all the things that he'd heard and prayed about and planned for, he now had seen with his own eyes, and now it's time to take the next step. Now it's time to execute the plan. So you see, the king gave, Nehemiah gave the king a timeline. I'll be gone this amount of time. He asked for letters that would grant him safe passage and for materials to rebuild the walls and gates. And now he'd done an on-site inspection and he was ready. He had a plan a plan that would involve people, a plan that would involve places and resources. But before he would ever promote that plan and stand up to the, before the people and, and say, this is what we need to do, he needed to believe that it was the right thing to do. You spend time before the Lord. You wait on the Lord and allow him to speak to you through his word. Allow him to speak to you through your times of prayer. Allow him to speak to you through the wise counsel of other believers in your life, which is one of the reasons that we need to be connected to the body of Christ, to be in small group Bible study, to have friends whom we trust and, and who we will listen to even when they disagree with us, because through that wise counsel, God can speak. And then God can speak through circumstances. Just the, the everyday ongoing circumstances of your life, God shows up and meets you on a corner somewhere and says, hey, did you get that? Did you pay attention to that? Did you learn what you should have learned from that? God speaks, and as God speaks, as God gives us direction, then we have a plan. Okay. A plan to move forward. A plan to get unstuck. Third part of the template. It's good to wait for the right time. It's really good to have a sense that this is what we need to do, to have a plan. But your heart has got to be in it. There's got to be a, a proper motive. There needs to be that understanding that, that we're not doing this because it's a good idea. We're doing this because God has shown us, God has taught us, and we want to be obedient to God's direction, obedient to the promptings of God's Spirit within our lives. So Nehemiah finally gathers the people. And said to them, you see the bad situation we're in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates are burned by fire. Now, I read that and I backed up and read it again. And I thought, eh, you know, yes, they'd seen it. They were living there. They'd been there for years while he had been off in Persia. They'd been waiting. But you know what? Sometimes you can get so accustomed to your circumstances that you become blind to them. You don't see them. Let me speak to you men in the room for a minute. Some of you guys have had projects around your house. It hadn't worked in a year and a half. It's been squeaking for six months. It hadn't flushed right since the kids were here last Christmas. And you've got a list, but you can walk by it every day and not see it. You can open that door and it can squeak loudly every time it opens and you never hear it. You are living in your world. And it's a happy world. And occasionally, occasionally, you get a hint that your wife may not be happy with how you address the issues. Because every now and then you hear, <sighs> you ask her if her asthma is acting up. No, it's not her asthma. It's you. It's you. But guys, isn't it amazing how blind we can become to things that are problematic to others? Because it just becomes our regular. And I think for many of those citizens that remained in the city, burned down walls, broken gates, and houses in disrepair had just become their normal. 
and they were living in the midst of it. Nehemiah stands up, a man who God obviously had endowed with leadership ability, with incredible administrative abilities. A man who I believe probably had a voice that commanded respect, and he stood up and he began to speak, and they listened to him, and he said, I don't know if you realize it or not, but these walls are torn down, and the gates have been burned, and your houses are a mess. And their ears perked up, and they began to say to each other, you know he's right. You know what, he's right. So what? What do we do about what we've been living in? What do we do about where we are? Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. Come on, y'all. Let's get beyond this. Let's, let's put, begin to put our world back together. Let's begin to establish some order around here and, and rebuild some of these gates and walls that represent not only our security, but, but represent who we are as a people. We are a reproach. People are looking at this mess and saying, what a mess. What are you people doing? Let's begin to rebuild. Take away the reproach. And I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. And then they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. Nehemiah said, y'all, the king has given me a lot of stuff. He's put a lot of confidence in me. And for the king's sake, we need to get on with this. No, he said, you need to understand that all the way through this process, for five months of praying and waiting, for five months of doing my job, I want you to know I have sensed that the good hand of God is upon me. And I am confident, not because of the king, I'm confident not because of Asaph and all of his timber. I'm confident not because of you and your ability to work. I'm confident because the good hand of our God is upon us and we can do this. And so they set about doing what had needed to be done. Obedience. God always blesses that obedience. There was a willingness to work among those citizens, a confidence in God's presence, even... Uh, a, a strength to, uh, to, to face the opposition. Because I can tell you this, Satan would like nothing better for the, than for you to stay stuck where you are, to stay right where you are and to not be faithful to follow the Lord's direction, for you to be comfortable in whatever situation you're in and not take the next step of obedience. In this case, it was Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. They represented Satan's opposition to what God was trying to do in Jerusalem. And the people said, finally, okay, our God is more powerful than anybody. Let us put our hand to the task. God blesses obedience by providing for his plan. God blesses obedience by protecting us against our enemy. God blesses obedience by preserving his people. It was a bad day. It was a bad situation, but God wasn't done. And I don't know where you are and how stuck you may be or unstuck you may be, but I know this. God is not a God who just says, okay, you just stay right there. We're going to move on. We'll circle back around to get you when you die. No. God wants us all to move along in obedience to him. What would that look like for you? Heavenly Father, You've allowed us to gather together in this place for worship this morning. We all loaded up, got in a vehicle of some kind, and we came from home. From our routine. From our place. And we came to church. And I, I pray that in some way, along the way, we've met you. In the song, in the scripture in the greeting, in the moving and working of your Holy Spirit, we, we've, I pray, met you. And maybe you have made us uncomfortable. Maybe you've poked us in that sensitive spot and made us aware that, yeah, we've gotten way too easy in our brokenness. And it's time to take that next step. Now, Father, I, I realize that maybe for some in this room, that next step is going to be a public commitment to you, a willingness to trust you with their life, their past, present, and future.
a desire to be a part of the church and to follow you in believer's baptism. It, it might require that, that kind of commitment. There may be somebody here who's looking for a church, Father, and if you've brought them, if you have directed them here, I pray that they, like Nehemiah, would be willing to follow your direction and cast their lot with First Baptist Church. But some of these decisions are going to happen without anybody moving a step out of that pew. And they're going to say to you, okay, Lord, it's time. Bless this invitation. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand together. Brother Tim's going to be here leading us in our hymn of invitation. Staff members are here at the front to, to pray with you, uh, to listen to you, to counsel you come while we sing together this morning. He take a seat for just a moment. We are grateful for what the Lord has been up to and uh, grateful this morning that we have some folk who've come desiring to be a part of, of us because they belong to Christ and they want to, to uh, become a part of this church family that we know as First Baptist Church. Mike, Susanna, y'all come and stand up here with me first. All right. Mike and Susanna King have been worshiping with us for a while. You've seen them. Uh, 
and, and they have been seeking the Lord, waiting on the Lord's prompting, and, and it's time. Today's the day. So they want to unite with us. Know, they know the Lord, have given the testimony of uh, baptism by immersion, and want to connect with this church family coming by letter from San Antonio. And we are glad that they are here, glad that they have come to be a part of our community and look forward to having them join in this family in the days to come. If you would join me in welcoming them and embracing them as a part of this family of faith that we know as First Baptist Church, would you let it be known by saying amen? amen. And amen. Y'all just stay right there for a minute. I'll take the card and I'll take y'all. That's okay. We'll, we'll get the, the rest of it after church. I'm going to stand right up here by the kings. Morgan Zapata comes this morning wanting you to know that she has come to know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Because of that, she wants to be a part of this church family and follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Uh, her dad, Michael, is here today coming wanting to be a part. He's a believer. He's given that testimony of baptism by immersion, coming by letter to unite with us and wanting to be a part of this family of faith, again, that we know as First Baptist Church. If you would join me in welcoming them into this church family this morning, would you let it be known by saying amen? amen. And amen. Great day, right? right? Amen. We're glad to welcome these. Brother Bill, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, to go ahead and take the Zapatas and the Kings out into the foyer where we welcome our newest members. Beautiful. You're the guy? Okay. We're going to stand together for our closing prayer. Chuck Thomas is going to come and lead us in that prayer. And as you go, as you go today, if you're stuck, why? Why? Chuck, pray for us, please, sir. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, it, it is such a blessing to see, to see these folks come to you, to answer the call, and to join this place. We, we pray that we, were, we will shoulder up with them, God, and, and uh, just support them through their journey, and uh, we know they'll support us as well. Lord, you are mighty. You, you know where we are. You know where our hearts are. You know what we need. We're thankful for that. Lord, as we go through this week, we pray the Spirit uh, will guide us, uh, that, we will, that we will answer your call, that we will just be obedient. We, we need to obey, and we know that. And just uh, keep calling, we will answer. Lord, thank you most of all for your Son, who died for us, who washed us clean, and just go with us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.